Jesus is coming and we have come to be ready for his coming. Now this is a beautiful day that the Lord has made for us and we will continue to rejoice and to be glad in him. Now this is the last part of this day. We are ending this day rejoicing and praising and blessing and honoring the Lord because the Lord made this day for us to rejoice in. And what better way is there to rejoice in the Lord and to sit at his feet and to listen to his word and to learn more of him and I'm so glad that you are all out there my friend I feel so very honored from my heart I feel so honored to be able to sit in front of you and to have you listen and learn from the word of God we all need to learn and we are so glad that you are there. When I say we, I refer to myself and the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is with me. And he's with you. And we are all together. We are in the presence of the Lord right now. And I'm never taking this for granted. And I'm never taking you for granted. Because you could have been somewhere else. You could have been doing something else. But you chose the good part. You chose the good part just like Mary did, to sit and to learn from the Lord Jesus Christ. And truly by His Spirit, we are being taught by Him. And we are going to learn so much more this evening. And we are going to be staying on the topic, which is so very interesting, isn't it? Uh, the topic of which I title, Biblical Revelations. Biblical revelations of the end times. And the Lord is revealing to us what to expect in these times. Yes, we are living in eschatological times. Eschatology is a, a subject that is very relevant now. Eschatology is no easy subject to deal with. But the Holy Spirit is going to help us. We are going to understand what we are to expect and prepare for and be ready to receive in these last and closing days. At this time which we refer to as the end of the age. We are coming very, very near at the door. Actually, we are at the door of the end of the age. Yes, this dispensation is about to close and the new one is about to open. And we need to know where do we, the church, belong? And what we, the church, ought to expect to happen next? Everything is outlined in the Word of God, the Holy Bible. This is the blueprint. This is the Word of God. It is inerrant. There are no mistakes, no contradictions in the Word of God. It is pure. It is holy. And it comes from the very mouth of God. This is why I refer to the teaching as coming from the Holy Bible. Because so many people today are coming up with all kinds of uh, different ideas, philosophies, uh, ideologies. They're coming up with so many things that are, are very much welcome by some groups of people because they have itching ears. But my friend, the church doesn't have itching ears. We have the air to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. This is why you are there. And many that will come on after the live stream this evening. And they're going to be viewing. Because if you check, you'll realize every broadcast is attracting hundreds of viewers. Yes. Hundreds of viewers. Why? Because they are interested and they are inquisitive as well. And they want to learn and they want to know more. This subject 
is very relevant. We are going to learn much as the Holy Spirit teaches us. Again, I want to say very special welcome again to all my very favorite and faithful, and I call you faithful viewers. God bless you, and may God bless your family, your loved ones, in Jesus' precious name. So we want to get into the word. We want to pick up from where we left off. This is part three. Yes, we are moving ahead. And we are getting closer to greater things yet to learn from. But we are taking it slowly. So please, let's not rush. Sit, have your Bible with you. And you can turn right away to Matthew chapter 24. Because we will continue to read from there. But I want us to understand that I'm teaching about the coming, or may I say correctly, because we are often hearing the coming of the Lord. Yes, He's coming. Jesus is coming. But I want to teach you of the several comings of the Lord. Yes, more than one, more than two, more than three. Oh, some of you are wondering where am I going? There are actually four comings that I want to teach you. Four comings of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the anointed Son of God, our Savior, and all four comings, my friend, the four comings of Jesus are revealed in the Holy Bible. In particular, they are revealed in what is uh, described as and referred to as the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are the first three out of the four. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Three of them were disciples of Jesus, and you know, they wrote according to what they saw and what they heard. But three, those three Gospels, they are synonymous. They actually know they are synoptic Gospels because they sh all share the same point of view. Very similar views to the same thing. And uh, you may see some variations, but we will understand why as we go along. But they all are saying the same thing as the Holy Spirit revealed it to them. So, the Synoptic Gospels, we see in Matthew chapter 24, in Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21, these three chapters from these three Gospel writers have the same message. And if you would study them after the broadcast, you would find them very interesting. Let me again repeat those three books and three chapters that we call the Synoptic Gospels that carry the same eschatological teachings that we are on right now. Matthew chapter 24, of which we will be reading from, uh, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter number 21. Hallelujah. So currently, we are reading chapter 24 of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Remember Matthew, as I said last, uh, when was it, last Friday? Matthew portrays Jesus with the face of a lion, as referred to also by um, Ezekiel, as he saw the cherubim with the four faces. And the four faces in the Old Testament in Ezekiel description are uh, actually is now described in the New Testament in these Synoptic Gospels and in also including John. But in the Synoptic Gospels we see Matthew portraying Jesus as a lion and you know a lion represents a king and a king in this case represents the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. So we are seeing the sovereignty and reading and describing the sovereignty of Jesus Christ 
the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the King of Glory, the King of Heaven and the King of Earth, and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that He is King and He is Lord. Hallelujah. So but that's Matthew. But if you go into Mark chapter 13 and read the same description and account as Jesus revealed it to his disciples concerning the end times, we would understand uh, that Mark in chapter 13 and the entirety of the gospel according to Mark is portraying Jesus as an ox. Yes, having the face of an ox like how it was seen by Ezekiel in, in the cherubim. Having the face of an ox represents, again, it represents uh, as a, an animal that carries a burden. Now Jesus is our burden bearer. He carried a cross. He carried our sins. Yes. And of course, he is our great sacrifice. So Mark describes Jesus like a sacrificial and burden-bearing animal. But of course we know him to be the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. And then of course Luke, one of the synoptic gospel writers, again in chapter 21, Luke writes about all that we are reading in Matthew 24, so I'm teaching you now. And Luke describes, or in fact portrays, Jesus as having the face of a man. The face of a man in Luke. So of course, I'm repeating this for those of you who did not hear me last Friday. And for those who have heard me, I'm just a bit uh, elaborating more upon this very important teaching. So Luke uh, sees Jesus as a man. And... Uh, you know, becoming a man, it reveals his humanity so that he could relate to us. We have a God that can relate to us. Our God who created us knows what it is to be like a man because he himself became a man. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, no other religion has anything close to this. Christianity is all the world needs. Because in Christ, we have a Savior who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows what it feels like to be human. You know, some people say, I'm only human. Of course, but God became human too. He was all God, he was all divine, but yet he was still man. And that's a great miracle. In fact, John, who is not one of the synoptic gospel writers, but John, who wrote about our Savior, John, who was very loved by Jesus in a very unique way, John describes Jesus as having the face of an eagle. And of course, an eagle in scripture represents divinity. So John describes Jesus as being the God-man. God. And so, with all these writers, these four Gospels, I mean, we have 27 uh, books in the New Testament, and they all teach about our Savior, our Redeemer. But I believe personally, even if we didn't have the others, and only had the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that would have been totally sufficient to bring salvation to humanity. But the reason why God in Christ and by the Holy Spirit brought other writers and particularly the one who wrote uh, two-thirds of the New Testament, I'm referring to the Apostle Paul, the reason why Jesus brought him in even though he was not one of the apostles. And I was studying scripture. And I know that Matthias took the place of the twelfth. But this is my opinion, right? I'm sharing this with you. I believe that the twelfth should have been, and I believe was intended to be, the twelfth to be the apostle Paul. Now that's my opinion, so please, don't anybody attack me on that. 
I know Matthias took the 12th position to be the 12th disciple after Jesus had risen from the, from the, the dead and, went and ascended back into heaven. Just before the day of Pentecost, they were having a meeting, meeting in chapter 1 of the book of Acts, and they decided to choose, and they, and, and they chose that one. But I believe the choice would have been the Apostle Paul, because we know what happened to Judas, and somebody had to take his place. But that's my opinion. And of course, we see that Paul, even though he was not one of the disciples, he became such a powerful apostle in the New Testament church, and he wrote so many epistles, and I believe, and of course we all learn, that all these epistles or letters were written to the early church and to the church today and for the church tomorrow. So the writings of Paul are very important and he himself wrote a lot, a lot about the coming of Jesus Christ. And we're going to get to that. So let us now continue. But you know, as I've said earlier, earlier on, Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. In fact, you should be ready. Because Jesus can come at any time. Yes. Even though we are studying the signs and the seasons, but we need to understand that whilst there are certain things that are going to come at different times, there is absolutely nothing that has to come to pass. For Jesus to come now, if he wants to. Of course, there are reasons why he has not yet arrived. And he has not yet returned to receive his church. And I will explain to you as we go along the reasons why. But apart from all of that, he can come now. Yes, he can. He can come before I say shalom which I normally do at the end of the broadcast. He can come while I'm speaking. He knows when he's coming. Are you prepared for Jesus to come? I'm speaking to someone here now, and I want to ask the question again. Do you want Jesus to come now? Do you want Jesus to come today? I want you to let that sink in. It's a question. Because I've asked so many people that question, and particularly many young people, I would ask them the question, do you want Jesus to come now? In fact, I've asked a lot of Christian people the same question. Would you like Jesus Christ to come now, today? And you know what? Some of them were very honest, and they said, you know what, Pastor? They said, you know what? Let him wait for a while. Not today. And not even tomorrow. Because they say to me that they want more time. Some of them want time to go to school and go to college and go to uh, university, go to tertiary level, get their diploma, get their certificate, get their degree. They want to achieve that. Some of them say, well, they want to get married. So they don't want Jesus to come today. They want him to come maybe a few years from now because they want to fall in love, get married, have children, etc. You know, some, some of them say they want to have a, they want to build a house. So they don't want Jesus to come now until the house is finished. Building. And they want to live in the house. And you know, these are all the different things. Some, some people say they don't want Jesus to come now because they want to live to see their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. Now, you know what, my friend? These are all the, some of the reasons that people say they do not want Jesus to come today. What is your reason? I'm asking you. Is there a reason that you do not want Jesus to come today? Is there something more important? Whilst all those things are very important and it's, it has its place in life, but is there anything more important than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, your Savior, coming today? Well, I think we need to answer that question honestly as well. But as for me and myself, I can speak for me. I would want Jesus to come now. I would love him to come today. Yes. Because I know if he comes, 
I know where I'm going and I know where uh, what, what I am to expect when he comes, when he carries me home. As the song says, Jesus is coming, people get ready, he's coming to carry you home. But you know what is even more important than that question and the answer to that question? The second question which is, are you ready for Jesus to come? Again, some people say I'm not ready yet. They want more time. My friend, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And the word salvation is not only to get saved, but to get ready and be ready to go. Are you hearing me? It's not only to be saved, but it's, it's also to be ready. Salvation means to be saved and to be ready. See, some, some, some of us interpreted salvation to mean only to be saved. So after we are saved, we are then to just live a long life. And of course, we are to live a long life as long as the Lord would want us to live. But if he were to come now, are you ready? So it would mean that you must answer that question as well. Are you ready? Are you saved? And as, are you ready to go? Those are two very important questions that I had to include into this teaching this, this uh, evening. Because I'm telling you something. You know what? There may be some just watching live this live streaming, there are more people that will watch this teaching after the live streaming. And I'm speaking to them. I'm speaking to those who are sitting on the fence, so to speak. And they have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Let me put it this way. It might sound shocking. But they have one leg in heaven and one leg in hell. Yes. I mean, something like that, a position like that is, is to, you are to expect a split. Yeah, you are to expect a split. One leg in heaven, one leg in hell. You are trying to live in both worlds at the same time and get the best of both. My friend, remember what I preached? When was it? I think it was on Sunday. You've got to leave one and cleave to the other. We have left the world and we are, we are cleaved to the Lord. Yes, we have become one in Christ and it is no longer you or me that liveth. It is Christ and his life that we live. Hallelujah. So my friend, you've got to be saved and you've got to be ready. Could I hear big amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. You know something very interesting I came across? Now we're going to Matthew 24, but we are taking our time because we have until Jesus come to continue this teaching. And of course, that could mean it could end tonight, right? But as long as he decides to stay longer or, you know, tarry, well, you know, my friend, we're going to keep studying and we're going to keep preparing and we're going to keep working and we're going to keep living for his glory for his honor and for his praise could somebody just shout praise the lord i want to hear your voice come on somebody praise the living god our savior jesus christ don't you just love him he's so wonderful hallelujah i found out that you know it is very interesting that there are several, hear me well, several biblical witnesses concerning the coming again of Jesus Christ. Several biblical witnesses and no ordinary witnesses. These witnesses I want to share with you very briefly to let you know that they are witnesses that testify of the coming of Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Christ. Now according to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 16, it says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So you must have two or three witnesses to establish a word. That is why it's very important that I bring this forward now in this evening's teaching. Because these witnesses are 
testifying the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and because there are two and more it is an established truth it is an established truth who are these witnesses number one Jesus himself yes the Son of God God incarnate God who became flesh and we read it a couple uh, meetings ago we read it from John chapter 14 and that's just one area of scripture that we're looking at that Jesus said very plainly very very clearly you don't you do not have to be a rocket scientist to, 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 uh, to, to explain this and you do not need to be a Bible scholar to, con you know, to, to, to confuse your head more, more again. You just need to be a Christian reading the Bible. Anybody can read it. Jesus said in John chapter 14, I will come again. That's what he said. Remember he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I will come again. So Jesus is that major witness. He said with his own lips the words that I will come again. Hallelujah. Even we read, we referred to in our last teaching from the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, where three times Jesus himself, not an angel, but Jesus, he said, Behold, I come quickly. Again, this is coming from the master's mouth. But you are thinking with me now, who is the second? Well, the second witness is God the Father. Yes, God the Father said that Jesus Christ will come again. Where do we find that scripture where God says that? When I began to search, when the Holy Spirit said, search, I searched. And I discovered, because when the Lord says something, He wants you to do something. And my part is to find it, His part is to reveal it. And so in Acts chapter number 3, and verse 19 through 21, Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, I will read for you. The scripture um, verses says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord then verse 20 says and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. Verse 21, who the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Now I, I read those three verses because they are connected. They are interconnected. But verse 20 is very clear that says, and he, who is the he? The he is God the Father. Remember, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, referring to the Father giving the Son. And the Holy Spirit's work was to conceive him in the womb of Mary. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three, the three in one worked together in bringing the Son of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, into the womb of Mary. But I only said that to explain this. In verse 20, it says, and he, so the he refers to God the Father. God the Father shall send, send who? Jesus Christ. And notice he uses the, 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 two, the two names. Jesus, Yeshua, and Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. So it is the Father who is saying in the book of Acts that he is going to send Jesus again. And 
so that means that he is a second witness that testifies that Jesus Christ is coming again. Amen. Now number three, the third witness. Who is the third witness? Did you get it? Anybody can guess? I'm not hearing you. Somebody's guessing. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. Yes, major witnesses to establish a truth that Jesus is coming again. You see, I'm saying all this, my friends, because this is not a man-made saying. This is not a religious saying. This is not a denominational saying. This is what is being said and has been said by witnesses that are very important to, to, to receive their testimonies from. Now, Jesus said it himself. The Father said it himself. Now, the Holy Spirit also said that Jesus will come again. Hallelujah. And we read this in Revelation chapter number 22 and verse 17. Yes. And in chapter 22 verse 17 in Revelation says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that hear it say, Come. And let him that is at thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life free. So in this first part of the verse, we see that the spirit and the bride, who is the bride? The church. So the church ought to be saying, come. But the spirit is also saying, come. The spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, clearly says, Come, Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit is saying to the world that Jesus Christ is coming for sure. The last witness, the last witness who testifies. I can give you a couple more, but because of time, I think this suffices it because the scripture says in Matthew 18, 16, you only need two or three. I'm giving you four. Who is the fourth? Yeah, I'm playing with you a bit. Could you guess? I'm sure you're trying. But I doubt very much if you will get this one. Who is the fourth? Well, my friend, the fourth is the devil. Yes! Even the devil said with his mouth that Jesus Christ will come again. Now, when the Holy Spirit told me this, it was my responsibility to go find it in scripture so that I can bring it to you. Because you must never say something that you do not have scripture to support and to establish. So I found it in Matthew chapter 8 and verses, verses 28 and 29. I will read it for you. In verse 29 it says, And when he was come to the other side, into the country. Now I'm picking up a, a, a narrative here. I'm picking up an account here from verse 28. And there the Bible says, when he was come to the other side, into the country of the, uh, the Gadarenes, which is the, 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 the place that most of you are acquainted with in scripture. In this verse it says Gergesenes, but it actually means the Gadarenes. Okay, it's the same place. No, he says, there met him two possessed with devils. I know the accountant Mark, uh, Mark tells us of one, and there's no contradiction. Because uh, Matthew decided to talk about the two, Mark decided to talk about the one. Are you with me? So there's no contradiction in scripture. You just need to understand. And this is what the Holy Spirit helps us with, the understanding. And the scripture says in verse 28, And when he was come to the other side, into the country of the Gergesenes, or Gadara, uh, the Gadara, there met him two possessed, two men possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass that way. But now verse 29, focus on and behold remember that word behold 
Give it all your attention now. Behold, they are about to say something important. They cried out. Who is crying out? The devils are crying out. Who are the devils speaking for? The devils are speaking for Satan himself. See, Satan has slaves. And these devils or demons are used to speak for him. But they are speaking out of the human mouth, the, the two men. And they cried out saying, now listen to what they are saying, or actually they are asking. What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? So now they are confirming with a question. <laughs> you see how the devil is so foolish? Now they are confirming the reality, hallelujah, that Jesus is the son of God. It only takes human beings to doubt that Jesus is the son of God. But devils do not doubt that he is the son of God. Devils believe that he is the son of God because they know him and they knew him and they knew where he came from. Hallelujah. But the last part of that verse is very profound. After they ask the question, they go into another question. And after they ask, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? They ask the question, art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Have you come to torment us before the time? Now those words are profound. They are deep and they are revelatory. Have you come to torment us before the time? So they are saying that Jesus is going to come to torment them. So they are testifying that Jesus is going to come. He's going to come one day and his coming will include the plan and purpose of tormenting them. But they are asking him, have you come before that time? Did you get what I'm saying? Have you come before that time? So reading in between the lines, we discover very clearly from the mouth of the devil that Jesus is sure to come. And they are afraid of his coming. But the church is happy for his coming. But the devil, the devils and Satan is terrorized and terrified of his coming because they know when he comes he's coming to torment them he's coming to cast them into the lake of fire he's coming to place them in captivity forever he's coming to cast a satan in the bottomless pit and then eventually into the lake of fire so they are saying have you come before your time they are testifying that he will be coming again so my friends, we have established this evening that Jesus is coming again because there are several witnesses. Now, I only have five more minutes and you know I took a lot of time in all of that, but all of that was very important because it's all part of the building of the structure on a solid foundation, which is the word of God. And I'm not teaching you anything outside of the word. No, my friend, I'm not going outside of the word at all. I'm not taking man's opinion. I'm taking God's revelation, which is the word of God, the Holy Bible. It's the only source of revelation of what to expect in these last days. So let us now go to the reading of chapter 24 of Matthew. And we may just be able to do maybe a few verses. But we will conclude with that uh, and we will pick up from there uh, next fri Friday coming in which we'll, we will go deeper. Remember I said Matthew is where we discover all that we need. In fact, let me, let me just give you the secret now. Remember I said the four comings of Jesus? I'm going to be talking about the four comings of Jesus. Well, my friend, my dear beloved, there are three comings, three comings 
that are embedded, I use the, 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 the term embedded within chapter 24 of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Three comings right there to discover. And that is why I am taking you through line upon line, verse after verse, so that we will then return to the verses and explain each of his comings. Amen. I'm excited. So let's continue. And every, every verse we go on, we discover something even more. There are added benefits in reading and studying the Word of God. So in verse number 8, when we left off last, Jesus said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. It wasn't the end, but the beginning. So my friend, this pandemic is just a drop in the bucket, so to speak. This pandemic will look like a child's play in comparison to what is yet to come. My friend, what is to come is far more terrifying and horrific than this COVID-19. And I want you to know this is not my opinion. This is God's word. In other words, the worst is yet to come in this world. So why don't you want Jesus to come? Because he will take us out of all of that. But it is sure to come. And Jesus said all these things, referring to the previous or preceding verses in the chapter, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then verse number 9, he said, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Wow. This was not just for the Jews. This is for the church. Yes, the Jews suffer terribly. But my friend, this includes the church. Do you know how many church, uh, churches are being persecuted right now in the world as I speak? Do you know that there is called, there's something called the persecuted church? Right now, on the ground, in certain parts of the world, they are being tortured, my friend. We are in the free world, but the free world that we are in is not going to be free forever. But right now, in many parts of the world, it is torture for the Christians. And it is coming to pass. It is happening as I'm speaking. And not because it's not happening in your country or my country. It's not happening. It's happening because Jesus said it will happen. Why will it happen? He said in verse number 9. He said for his name's sake. I want to tell you something very quickly before we go. Listen very carefully. Do you know the world hates the name Christ? And the, and, and the name Christian? Christian, Christian, Christian. They don't want Christian around. If that is why they removed Christmas out of United States at one time. But thank God for President Trump. I hope nobody is angry with me. But thank God when he came into office, he said, I'm returning the, the, the word Christmas for people to say Merry Christmas again. Because they took it out. Before he came into, into, into the office, they took it out and they want to take it out again, my friend. They want to take Christmas out of the celebration of the birth of our Savior. They want to say, let me tell you what they want to say. They want to say, happy holidays. Or maybe they just want to say, have a good time. I don't know. But they do not want the, the, the word Christ, the Messiah. They do not want to hear that anointed name. That word that describes the only one who was anointed to destroy the works of the devil. And that is Yeshua, the son of the living God. Hallelujah! And they are going to, the Bible says, Jesus said, for his name's sake, for the name of Jesus Christ, you are going to be afflicted. You are going to be tormented. He said, you are going to be killed. Don't you want Jesus to come now? Yes, I do. But what if he doesn't? What if we have to go through some of this? No, this is not the great tribulation that we are going through. And I'm going to be teaching about that as we go along. 
but there is some tribulation that will certainly affect the believers in Christ. Are you ready for that? Are you prepared? I'm going to close in just a few minutes. I'm looking for my assistant. She doesn't want me to stop this evening. She's so engrossed in this right now. She's just flowing with the streaming. But I'm going to close in just a few minutes. I know it's interesting because this is real. Listen to me. Could Jesus ever die? Of course not. If there was one lying bone in Jesus, he would still be in the grave. His bones would be there. His lying bones, lying bones would be in the tomb. But my friend, there wasn't a lying bone in him. We have a lot of lying bones in us. But thank God he shed his blood to wash those bones. But Jesus could never lie. And the reality is he rose from the dead to prove it. He was never a liar. And he will never lie in whatever he says to you. And nothing from his word could ever be a lie. And he said that they are going to afflict us. They are going to torture us. They are going to torment us. They are going to come against us. They are going to fight us. And that is what governments are do you, I want to tell you something before I, I have so much to tell you before I close. But do you know something, my friend? Governance. That's why you've got to pray for your government. But the leadership and governance are being uh, manipulated by Satan right now to come against the church, to shut the voice of the church, and to even bring persecution to the church. I'm telling you, it's coming. But we need to be ready. Jesus is coming. He's certainly coming. Hallelujah. God, you. Pray, that's so loud. <laughs> She's working with me. Praise God. Praise the Lamb of God. I love you, my friend. I love you. And I want you to be ready. And I want you to help others to be ready. Share this teaching. And tell people with your mouth, Get ready, get ready, get ready. Jesus Christ is coming again. And he's coming to save the church out of what is yet to come. It's better to be in the church now. You do not want to be in the church after. I'll be talking about that as well later on. But between now and Friday, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his beautiful countenance over you and your loved ones. And the Lord give you his peace. I declare and decree and I proclaim that you are blessed. You are protected. You are delivered. You are sheltered. You are shielded. I say, I say to you, no weapon formed against you will be able to prosper. Could I say one more thing? The Lord impressed this on my spirit to say to you, every person that sits under my ministry anointing, every person that sits under the anointing that God has placed over me in my ministry will prosper. Did you hear me? They will lack nothing. I declare, declare and proclaim what I know from the Holy Spirit. You will not lack money. Money will come. Don't worry about money. Don't worry about it. It will come. Every person that sits under the anointing of my ministry will testify sooner or later, the Lord has provided for you. God bless you. Good evening and good night. Shalom.